Our scripture today is from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's good to be with you. As you can hear, my voice is a little, uh, little, little weaker today, so I'm going to lean into the microphone. Thank you, tech team. Thank you, audio guys back there. Um, I'm really excited to start uh, getting into this new series we're calling the, the Light of the World as we get into the Gospel of John. And I'm really excited about this for, for a few reasons. But one of those is, is because it's my ongoing commitment to, to you, to us as a church, to try to give us what I like to think of as a well-rounded biblical diet. Or as the old uh, theologians used to put it, I'm trying to teach the, um, the whole counsel of God. And so if you were here uh, way back last year in spring, we went through Galatians. Those of you guys who are here, if you remember that, uh, that was part of the New Testament, one of the epistles which is a part of the a section of scripture that, that, are, that include letters uh, to the early church. And then last summer we went through the book of Jonah. I really loved that. Jonah is a part of the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures leading, leading up to Christ. And then uh, this last fall we kind of took a pause on those sorts of things and did Explore God, which was a topical series, uh, joining a Bay Area-wide initiative. Um, but, but I'm excited now to get back into the New Testament, and particularly one of the Gospels. And the Gospels are the specific part of the New Testament that focus directly on the life and ministry of Jesus. There's four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all wrote their Gospel accounts. Gospel literally means good news. And so when you hear, you know, the, the Scripture or a book in the Bible like the Gospel of John... It's really saying, here's a proclamation of the good news of Jesus. And John starts his gospel here in kind of a unique way, or at least different than the other gospel writers. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, more or less, in their gospel accounts, just jump straight into the action. Mark, he just jumps straight into the adult ministry life of Jesus. Matthew and Luke jump into the Christmas story, you know, Jesus' birth. Well, John here goes way back, I mean, I mean, understatement, way, way back when he starts with the words, in the beginning, and even if you didn't grow up in the church reading the Bible, uh, chances are you recognize immediately what John is hearkening back to with those words. When he says, in the beginning, when he starts his gospel account, in the beginning, he's of course hearkening back to the creation account, and frankly, before that, even. And so what we see just right out the gates as we're getting into the book of John is, is John giving us these breathtakingly high truth claims of Christ. I mean, they're so lofty, they're enough to give us a nosebleed. They're, they're wonderful. They're incredible. 
Full disclosure, texts like these are really intimidating for me to preach because they are equal parts simple and extremely deep. So we're going to be looking at claims today here that we could just almost take for granted because they're just so seemingly simple or straightforward, and yet they are anything but. In fact, we need to really think upon these things and, 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 and ponder them. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these lofty, of great height, true claims about Christ and consider their profound implications for our lives. Okay? So we're going to look at these big, lofty claims, breathtaking claims that John lays out here of Christ as he begins his gospel account, proclamation of Jesus Christ, and consider, try to unpack as best we can with God's help today, what that means for our lives. So let's pray and then we'll, then we'll jump in. Father, it's my prayer every week that you would open your word to us. But I almost, in some ways, feel that all the more today with the text in front of us. These are, these are big and incredible claims that, that we can, first of all, take for granted, for those of us who believe them, receive them, follow them. But they are also ones that we just so deeply and desperately need and to, li and to live in more and more. And so, Father, would you give us your spirit to understand these things? And I want to pray especially for those who are maybe here today checking out uh, the things of you. Don't consider themselves followers of yours. Would you especially speak to them and through the power of your spirit and your word, draw them even into your family today. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at these breathtaking truth claims of Christ and why they matter in our lives. Here from, from John, just the first chapter. The, the first thought. Remember, simple and deep. First thought, John is saying, Jesus is God. Like, make no mistake, John is saying, Jesus is God. He starts with the words, as we mentioned earlier, in the beginning was the word. I mean, he's saying Jesus was there at the beginning. Like, before there was a beginning, Jesus was already. Jesus, in other words, he's saying, is eternal. Um, there's this, uh, a, lot of, a lot of theologians call the section of scripture that we're looking at here in the first part of John chapter 1, the prologue, okay? Because what John is doing is he's starting to set up, he's, he's introducing Christ and a lot of the themes that he's going to hearken back to when he starts to talk about Jesus' life and ministry explicitly. And so one of those themes that he brings up, as we just laid out, is is Jesus is eternal. Well, we're going to see that come up over and over and over again as we make our way through, through the book of John. But one of the, the classic texts that, that came to my mind as I was thinking about these things, this idea that Jesus is eternal, was the famous account of God speaking to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. So Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Moses is the leader that God came to to call him to deliver God's people out of Egypt, out of slavery there, out of the hand of Pharaoh. So God showed up to, to Moses there. You can check it out in Exodus chapter 3. And he calls him to do this. And Moses is nervous about that. Makes sense, right? It's kind of a big task to be called into. And part of what Moses wants as he's talking to God is affirmation or confirmation that like, okay, I can do this or you're going to help, right? And so one of the things in this conversation Moses says to God is, Okay, if I'm going to go, though, you got to tell me who sent me. You, when I go to the people and they ask who sent me, you got to let me. You got to give me an answer to that. I'm should be showing up to people to like deliver them from a nation. Like, can you give me something? Who do you say that you are, and how? Who do you? Who can I say that you are when I go to the go to the people? And God said something to Moses then that is still mind-boggling to think about to this day. He said, "Okay, Moses, here's what you tell them." You tell them, I am sent you. And when we go through the book of John, we're going to see that Jesus will no less than claim that of himself with seven I am statements. In the book of John, Jesus will make seven I am statements about himself. Perhaps my favorite one, you know, this idea that Jesus is the great I am, you know, this idea that God doesn't exist even in time, he, he uses the, the verb to be to describe himself, is true of Jesus. We can see, for instance, in one of such occasions, at the end of John chapter 8, when some religious leaders, uh, certain Jews come, and really they're, they're challenging the, the validity of Jesus' testimony. 
and they get into conversation with Jesus. They're saying, your, your testimony is invalid. You're just, you're just your own witness. You need other witnesses. And Jesus says, look, my testimony on itself is valid because I came from the Father. I'm coming to let you know who God the Father is like. Like, there's no one else who's ever been there. There's no other witness that can speak to that. So what are, you, what are you talking about is essentially what Jesus is saying. And at one point he goes on to say, and if you believe him, if you receive me, you will receive life and you will not die. Well, at that, these religious leaders said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? We won't die. Even Abraham and, and, and all the prophets who followed God died. How could you say, no, they, you, you won't, we won't die? And Jesus says, I, yeah, I tell you the truth. That's, that's how it works. And you need to understand something. You reference Abraham. Abraham looked forward to the day that I would be here. He saw my day and he rejoiced, Jesus said to them. And at this they go, what are you t- you're talking as if you know Abraham personally. You're not but 50 years old. And then Jesus probably gave, no, not probably. Jesus gave the greatest mic drop in human history when he said, I tell you the truth before Abraham, I am. Jesus is the eternal God. There's no jumping around that, mixing it up. John is just trying to say unequivocally, he's eternal. In the beginning, he was, he was God because he is God. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's eternal. He's also the creator, John says. When he highlights this in verse 3, he says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. There's a lot of texts that echo this thought about Christ. Let me just read one of them. Colossians 1 says it this way, For in him, that is Christ, all things were made, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is eternal. He is the creator. And then here's the most obvious cop call out of all in our text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is so much theology jammed in this little text here that we don't have time to unpack it all. But this is the theology of the Trinity. Which is it, John? Jesus was with God, or Jesus was God? John's like, yes, both. He was with God, and was, is God. This is This is the theology of the Trinity, how God is one in three persons, we say. But what does this mean for us? As we say, Jesus is God, he's eternal, he's creator, he's, he's, he's one, one person, in, he's of, of, the, of, the, of the three in one God. Like, what does this mean for us? Well, this has to mean to know Jesus is to know God. For those of you who have been followers of God for a long time, do you take that for granted? To know Jesus is to know God. Uh, over the years, I've had many people uh, share with me the thought, oh, Jesus was a wonderful uh, moral teacher. As in, that's essentially all he was. He's a good moral teacher. And you know what? If that's your opinion about Jesus, fair enough. But that would go against completely what Jesus says of himself. That's not Je- taking Jesus at Jesus on Jesus' terms. Jesus said, he might be a good moral teacher, but he claimed to be God. Um, if you're here today and you're checking out the claims of Christ, you're checking out Christianity, here's what this means. To know Jesus is to know God. There are plenty of things we could share with you today to try to help you along, get, um, get clarity and learn and maybe move towards faith or whatever that might look like for you. We could, we could share uh, answers to some of your objections. We could share stories of life impact and change. Dare I say miracles? Yeah, I stand. We could share all these different things with you. But by far and away, the best thing that you can do to understand Christianity, God, is to know Christ. In other words, to read about him. Here we are in a gospel account where it's almost exclusively just about his life and ministry. We get to know the mind and heart of Christ. You get to know the mind and heart of Christ. So you get to go to the text and go, does that pass the sniff test? It's kind of a big sniff test, wouldn't you say? If you claim to be God, so you can go and read. Does it add up? Do you you buy it? I mean, one of the things I've just been thinking about a lot over the years is like, I mean, could you imagine 
if you were to try to make up stories about someone who claimed to be God and tried to make it sound legitimate, how would you do that? I mean, even the smartest people on the planet, like how would you, you would, you would have so much, like, and you know what I mean? Go to the scripture and look at the claims of Christ, who he is, his heart and mind, and decide for yourself, does it, does it add up? Uh, this reminds me of C.S. Lewis's famous uh, question. You got to ask yourself, is Jesus liar, lunatic, or Lord? Uh, I think this is from one of the books that we actually will, will give out to those of you who are checking out the faith. Uh, Mere Christianity, great book. But he said, you got to ask the question, is Jesus liar, lunatic, or Lord? Because he claimed to be God. If he claimed to be God and that's not true, he's crazy. You know what I mean? That's insane. I love uh, how Bono, front, front man of U2, put that in an interview uh, a number of years back. He, and this is a guy who's seen, you know, rock and roll fame to the nth degree. You know what I mean? And the impacts of that on a, on a human being, right? Bono said of this, he's like, man, if the claim that Jesus is God, he's like, that is so beyond nuts. It, it makes rock and roll messianic complexes look like child's play. And yet, if it's true, it's true. He's like, you got to look at look at the text. Does he does he does it does it bear up? Does it does the does what you read of Christ bear under the weight of Jesus claiming to be God? It's like, okay, is he, is he in, or is he insane, right? Or is he a deceiver, right? Is he is he lying? Which would just be nuts, right? I mean, you know, you can probably be a little bit of liar and lunatic here, but the whole idea of just trying to pull the wool over people's eyes, you know. Or is it actually true? And the, the crazy thing about Jesus, crazy thing, is that when you read about him, he, he constantly on every page comes across with, I will say, what feels like otherworldly divine authority and yet also perfectly embodies humility. You know what I mean? Those two things are like, can you get your head around? Look to the stories of Jesus. To know Jesus is to know God. And I would just say for those of you who are followers of Jesus, are you, are you spending time with him in his word? Are you spending time with God in his word? Because at the end of the day, the best part, the main part of going to him in his word is not just to get knowledge or comfort or guidance or wisdom, which his scripture, God's word, has for us. The main thing we go to is just to get more of him. To know Jesus is to know God. It's to get to know his heart, his mind, his character, and how he loves you and cares for you and thinks about whatever it is you're facing and is with you in the midst of that. God is, excuse me, Jesus is God is the first thought that John is saying here in this incredibly simple but yet deep text here. Second one is, Jesus is the light and life of the world. Jesus is the light and life of the world. We see that in verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then if you look down in verse 9, excuse me, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So back in verse 1, John introduced Jesus as, in the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus is referenced as, as the Word, or in the, or in the original Greek, logos. Jesus is the logos. We could say so much about that. But in a sense, what John is saying is, Jesus is the perfect self-expression of God. When, when it says that Jesus is the Logos or the Word, Jesus is the perfect self-expression or perfect revelation of God. Meaning, Jesus is the perfect message of God. He, he brings his ways, God's Word to us to understand. And what these texts, uh, these verses on top of it are saying when it refers to the light and, and life is, when, as, he, as he's God's perfect message, as light shines the way, he guides us into true life. Jesus guides us in, into true life, and we desperately need that. I, I don't know about you guys, but, like, I, I'm reading the news. I, I, I love to read the news just because it gives me a, a, a pulse on just kind of things happening in the world and in our lives. 
But it is getting increasingly hard to read the news, wouldn't you say? And it's like, man, you can't read the news nowadays and just look at the things happening in the world and our country and not have a heavy heart. Or your heart just, just totally break. And uh, with all the conflict happening around the world, with a lot of the, the social strife and divisions and the political tensions and all of that, it's really, it's really hard. But you know what the saddest thing, hardest thing for me as I'm reading about that, all this is like, and what's the solution? You know, you look at some of these conflicts, it's like, what's the solution? It's like, I've been thinking a lot about Jesus' words, love your enemies. So we talk about God's word, Jesus, and his ways being what lead us into true life. With just three words, he has given us some incredible thoughts to really help pave our way in a way that our world desperately needs right now. Three words, as by way of example, love your enemies. It's a terribly hard thing to do, but something our world desperately needs right now. Because when you look at the world and you look at all these conflicts, or you look at your own conflict or the pain around you in your life, what is the solution? Jesus, the word, light in life, says there is a solution. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Christians are to lead out in saying, while I might not agree with you or I might not condone what it is you're doing, I'm going to look to love and care for you. I'm going to look to try to be sympathetic in conversation with you. I'm going to look to try to serve you. I'm going to look to pray for you positively. Not just calling down curses. Don't do that. Jesus said, love one another. I mean, it's not like you just snap your hands and do that, but there is a way. Jesus, with just three words, excuse me. <coughs> Getting a little excited, so i got to go back to my water. Jesus, the word, our light with just three words, gives so much vision, wisdom. It's just three words of a big book. God's word is so good. He lights our way. <clears throat> if you were here a few weeks back, you know, we looked at uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, which I'd like to put on the, the screen again for you. All of God's word is God-breathed. Remember that? It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Are you going to God's word, those of you who are followers of his, and letting and sitting underneath it? That's how we said it last week. Are you, are you letting it, to use language of today, guide you into true life? Is it teaching you? If I were to ask you, and you're a follower of Christ today, and I would, if I were to ask you, what is God teaching you right now? Would you have an answer to that? Now, I don't want to be legalistic about it. I don't feel like, oh, no, i got to, you know. But the idea is God is always teaching his children. And he gives us his word. There's any number of ways we need to be taught. I mean, infinite, this side of heaven. Is, is God's word teaching you? Is, it, is, it, is, is God's word bringing to light things in your life that are probably in the darkness? Are there things in your life that maybe you are doing that are apart from God's ways? That maybe you need to come to repentance is a biblical word for it. Turn from. Confess. And by the way, receive forgiveness from. Life as you move into the life that God's called you into. Does, does God's word ever bring light into the dark places? Jesus' word. Jesus is the word. He's the light and life of the world. Bringing, bringing his truth to set us into, bring us into true life. He's God, he's light and life of the world. And then number three, John tells us that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Verse 14 says it this way, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his dwelling, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we've already kind of highlighted that God, through Jesus, as the word, has made his truth to lead us, to guide us into true life. It's truth. Right? Or his, his ways. What we also see here is that he gives us his grace. And it's important to note that it's not just some grace and some truth, or at times truth and at times grace, but it's all grace and all truth all the time. God is, Jesus came to us full of grace and truth. He is both things, grace and truth, to us all the time. And that is, that is wonderful news. That is wonderful news. Uh, there's a very, very classic text that 
You can't but mention when we talk about Jesus bringing together so beautifully grace and truth. And that is the time when the religious leaders brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, tossed her in front of him, and wanted to see how he would handle that. They were trying to trap him. They, were trying, they knew that Jesus had a reputation for being gracious among the people, but he was also a teacher of the law, and so he, he understood truth and its importance. And so they figured, let's get this gal, let's put, in front of, uh, put her in front of him, and let's see him get his way out of that. Let's see him be gracious in that, because he's going to have to bring it down on her. You know what I've thought about over the last few years, just as a real in, uh, incidental side note, is where was the dude? You know what I mean? This woman was thrown in front of Jesus. You know what most Bible commentators think, Bible scholars think? They actually, the consensus is what probably was happening is these people were trying to set up Jesus with this gal. Using this gal as a pawn and the guy was probably in on it. Meaning this was despicable through and through no matter how you see this. And it was probably all the more so. Tracking? But here's Jesus in what these guys were trying to create to be an impossible situation. They even had already picked up the stones to stone her because that was, that was the law. And Jesus very famously was down in the dirt doodling. How do you think the Son of God, full of grace and truth, would respond in a situation like that? I don't even know how I'd make it up. But it's like, a, I, I just want to watch and see. He lifts up and with just one question he dispels mob mentality. How do you dispel mob mentality? You know what I mean? Like, can you? Looks up and with one question dispels mob mentality when he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Goes back down to doodling. It's a question you might think the word become flesh might ask us. Well, it says, starting with the oldest, which I never missed that detail, starting with the oldest, going to the youngest, all the mob, they, they, they started dropping their stones and they left. That left Jesus and this woman there. And you got to imagine what she was thinking, what she was feeling, you know, all that was going on in her mind. And Jesus asked her a couple questions. She said, where have your accusers gone? Is there anyone who condemns you? She says, no, sir. And then Jesus says the most gracious words, neither do I condemn you. Jesus came full of grace, unmerited favor. Some of you guys need to hear this today. Some of you need to hear these words today yourself. Neither do I condemn you. God loves you. He is so gracious. No matter what it is, your past, what it is you've done, you regret, Jesus doesn't condemn you. He loves you. He's gracious to you. Neither do I condemn you. But Jesus also added then the words of truth. He said, but go and leave this life of sin. Grace and truth. He was calling her out of this life of sin in order to love her into a better life, to help her, to, to rehabilitate her, to restore her. It was, it, was, it was both and, all grace, all truth, all the time. And God calls us to receive both and offer each other both um, as a community here at Current. We want to be what I like to think of as both a come as you are and don't remain as you are community. Come as you are, don't remain as you are. And I put myself in this, by the way. But come as you are, meaning whatever your background, whatever it is you bring to the table, imperfections and all, join the club because we're all imperfect. I have a buddy who's, who just started a church, and I saw on social this week that there, his slogan on his, on his sweatshirt is, uh, no perfect people allowed. I was like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Come as you are. But don't remain as you are, because the reality is, is all of us, all of us, not just those coming in, all of us desperately need Christ. We also are growing in him. And so we need each other, and we, we, starting with ourselves, just go, okay, we're, we're growing in this as people who need Jesus, and Jesus is calling us to be increasingly like him. Come as you are, don't remain as both are loving. God loves us too much not to be gracious to us. He also loves us too much not to call us into new and better lives. Listen to how uh, the late Tim Keller put this. He said, love, that is grace, I'll just in our, for our purposes, without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. 
It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot hear it. We need both grace and truth, and Jesus offers both freely. How? We're told the word became flesh. I love this thought. You know, John here could have used a lot of words to describe how Jesus came to be among us. And he actually very obviously passes over other words that could have easily, if not more easily, have worked. He could have said the word became a man, right? Or the word became, uh, t- took on a body. Or so, you, you know what I'm saying? He, he chose this word flesh. Sorry, I'm getting excited again. <clears throat> it is exciting. He took on flesh. This Greek word sarx, is, it, mean, it, it has the, the meaning of the whole sense of the person, but it means our fragile and vulnerable state. Meaning, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word took on vulnerability. The great I am took on flesh, fragility, vulnerability in order to die on the cross for your sins and mine. The one who is perfectly invulnerable, made himself vulnerable such that he could bring and offer us the fullness of grace and truth. That's what the cross is all about. That's what he's done for you and me. And so therefore, we have some things that we can do about What does this matter for us? Number one, you can receive it. If you're here today and you've never received what uh, the, the gospel, the good news, maybe you've thought of yourself as Christian. The gospel is Jesus came to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. To offer grace and truth, which he accomplished on the cross through dying on the cross for your sins and mine. And one of my favorite verses that I actually reference all the time here at Current, if you've been here, is an invitation, uh, John 1, 12. It says, and yet to all who did receive him, to all who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You can receive him today. You could become a child of God today. The great I am who loves you made a way for you to be in eternal relationship with him. And it means believing on his name and receiving him. That's saying that you accept him for who he is and who he says he is. That he's eternal, that he's creator, that he's your Lord and Savior. It means that you put your hope and trust in him. Try your best to follow him. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, according to Jesus, which is what matters. And you can receive him today. And for those of you who have received him, are you receiving and living from His grace and truth. Some of you need his grace today. Some of you need to hear the words, neither do I condemn you. Maybe there's a sin that you've just been struggling with. You've confessed it any number of times. You've tried to turn from it any number of times, but you just, you're overwhelmed with guilt and shame and all the, Jesus says to you, neither do I, neither do I condemn you. He loves you gracious, graciously. He died for you. Some of you, maybe you need to hear the words, go and live the life, uh, go and leave the life of sin. You need to hear truth, his truth for you. And that is he wants a better life for you. He doesn't just want you to level up in Christianity or achieve something. Will he? He, no, he wants what's best for you, life. And he calls you into that. So number one, we could receive it. Number two, we need to offer these things to one another because Jesus didn't just come to give it to us for us to receive it. But for us to, as we receive it, offer it to one another. And that's what we get to do in in community, is is be full of grace and truth to one another. Now, uh, this is such a big thought. I think it's so important. But I just want to do the best I can to kind of unpack this a little bit. Because I I actually humbly believe, I'm no theologian, okay? But hold on to this loosely. But I almost feel that John 1 14, so this grace and truth principle is perhaps the single greatest principle to govern relationships within a church body. We are to be, extend each other grace and truth. And here's the way I've thought about it over the years, and I've found that others have thought about it this way too. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll with it, and if it's helpful, great. It's not in one ear, out the other. It seems to me that when it comes to living and, and, and offering grace and truth to others, we each tend to, whether it's from personality upbringing, you know, culture, whatever the case, we each tend to lean more one than the other. Does that make sense? We all tend to be a little bit more grace people. We all tend to be a little bit more truth people. Do not nudge your person next to you and tell them what they are. You know what I mean? It's like we all kind of tend. <coughs> One second. 
You know what I mean? And so, and I don't want to overly simplify this, right? We're not consistent. We're not Jesus. But that's the point. Jesus calls us to be both. All grace, all truth, all the time. And he calls us as to, to increasingly be these things for each other. <clears throat> grace people tend to just be accepting of everything. They're great to be around, right? They just kind of go with the flow. And The problem with grace people it can, it, is it can be that they don't really know or have the courage to stand up for what's right and wrong. Or what's best for us in terms of growing holistically, right? Truth people, uh, you know, you might admire, we can admire their passion. They might speak out for right and wrong. But we might wonder when they take up a cause that they're loyal to, are they loyal to us? And they might be slow. They're often slow to forgive if they'll forgive at all, quick to judge. But we need to be all grace, all truth, all the time. Um, Listen to how uh, Pastor Kevin DeYoung wrote this. When he was thinking along the same lines, he said, if you are a grace person, you are most concerned about being loved. If you are a truth person, you are most concerned about being right, even when it means being unloving. Both have their dangers. And here I I thought was his insight. Something is wrong if everyone hates you, and something is probably just as wrong if everyone loves you. What kind of manager would you say you are? Kind of parent, spouse, roommate, coworker. You tend to move one direction. Remember Tim Keller's thought. Love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and firms us, but it keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. Uh, Some leaders in the church recommended that our family watch The Hill. Have you seen this? It's about a a little uh, kid, pastor's kid, who really wants to play baseball, but he has a spinal condition, so his legs just don't really work. And, and his dad is just a very, you know, zealous preacher and just sees that. And out of love for this guy, says, hey, you're not going to play. Like, let's just get that dream out of you because it's going to be hard to have that dream. And, you know, he wants to play. And, you know, the, the end of the movie, he, well, spoiler alert here, he's playing major league baseball, okay? So it's pretty cool. I knew that before I watched this movie too somehow, so I'm not trying to ruin it for you. Um, but hey, the, the beauty of the movie is even though you know that's coming, it's great. Um, so, uh, it, but it's amazing. There's this, one, there's this one character, so it's the grandma, who all along the way sees this tension with the, with the son and with the dad and, and understands the perspectives from both. And she is kind of what I would call more a truth person because along the way she's just going to the dad, like, you just got to let him play. You know, she just have these outbursts when she just can't handle it anymore. And the dad is just like, nah, you can't play. You know, it's like, it's like one of those dynamics. But then you see her transformation, all these guys' transformation, which is why it's a, it's a tearjerker. I'm just going to warn you on that. Um, but by the end of the movie, you see that even with this grandma, she got into the place where because she always leans truth, she had found out how to apply grace in the truth. And that, it's worth noting, is when the dad heard it. The point here is not, hey, I think I lean true, so I'm going to lean in. That's my gift to the church. Hey, I'm a grace person. I'm just going to lean in. That's the point is, no, if you were a truth person, could you imagine if your truth came with grace? Grace people, could you imagine if you brought us truth with that grace? We need to all be all grace, all truth, all the time with his help. And that's what we're called to be. And I just think it's so funny to me. It's, I mean, I just, I, it's, it's not coincidence in my mind. It's, like, it's as, if, as if the Lord knew that this was sign-up stays for current groups. You know what I mean? It's like, here we are. To me, one of the best ways, in fact, probably tactically, the best way that this can live out in the life of the church for you, for me, is within small groups, in Bible studies, what we call current groups. It's a time in which we, we like to say, go from rows to circles, and we get to get into each other's lives and practice the very things that Christ calls us to, to love one another, serve one another, care one another, honor one another, and all the one another commands in there. We get to be grace and truth for each other. But there's an important principle to see in the midst of all that that is, to me, not lost in John. Because the way that we do this is like how our Lord did it for us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's to say the word, the great I am, intentionally, deliberately wrote himself into relationship with us. He's intentional in relationship. We've got to be intentional in relationship. Grace and truth that we desperately need 
and desperately uh, need to offer others as a part of a church body doesn't just happen. We've got to make our dwelling among each other, so to speak. We've got to be in relationship. So if you're here today, particularly if you've never been in a group before, or you, had, you were in a group years ago and you're just, I'm not sure, I would encourage you to consider signing up for a group and attending at least four weeks. Now, that's very arbitrary. There's no Bible verse for that, okay? So I'm not trying to. My point, though, is sign up and commit to staying long enough that you can kind of go, okay, I, can, I feel the relationship starting to form. Does that make sense? I mean, ideally, you'd stay the whole time, right? But the idea is as we dwell with each other, we can be grace and truth for each other, loving each other. And, and, as that, and that happens over time. We have uh, sermon-based groups, which is the vast majority of groups, where I and, and another leader will find a, a, a parallel text to the same topic that we cover on a Sunday during the sermon. And we'll study that together on, on a week. We'll share together. We'll pray for each other. There's one other group called an exploratory Bible study. This is a group specifically for those of you who are either very new in your faith or you're trying to figure out the faith of Jesus. If that is not you, this is not your group. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that we protect the culture of that group for those who have the types of questions that people who are new in the faith are checking out have. Does that, does that make sense? But exploratory Bible study, uh, sermon-based group, would you sign up for one today? We've got some wonderful leaders who are in this with us and we're excited about all the potential. All right, Whew, I told you, John 1, there's a lot. <laughs> Lots of wonderful, breathtaking truths of Jesus with incredible implications. To know Jesus is to know God. Jesus guides us in the way of true life, and he offers and helps us receive and offer one another the fullness of grace and truth. Uh, we're going to see more of these things, themes unpack as we make our way through the book of John. But guess what? We can start to live this out, not just think about it, live this out in groups. So I encourage you to sign up. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll continue our time in worship. Father, it's, on, <laughs> it's with scriptures in front of us like, like this that we all the more want to thank you for your word. In the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. But we are so grateful for Your Word. Would you, would you help the Word increasingly shape our lives? Would you help us go to it for You, for Your heart, for Your mind? Would, would Your love and care, beauty, truth and justice rub off on us that we might, with Your help, offer it to one another? I pray for those thinking about small, signing up for a small group today. Lord, if it would be a, something you're calling them into, would you give them the courage to take that step? Father, would you help us as a church be here for one another in these ways, in grace and truth. We, we sorely need your grace and truth even in offering it to one another, but we know that's what you're quick to offer. It's in Christ's name we pray all these things.